Shiva Balari, who's a, a brilliant scholar, speaker, and tweeter. And uh, many of you might know that, provided the excitement I can sense in the room. <laughs> she is. She came from Brown University, where she teaches history and art history. She has written a lot on Iranian visual culture, on art and politics, on Iranian art and the revolution. She has also written a biography of Saddam Hussein, no less. And today she will talk to us about uh, Mohammed Afghami's Dubai-based art collection. And it will be a way of having a time and space travel between Dubai and Iran. The title of her talk is 2005 Alternative Futures of Art History Between Iran and Dubai. Uh, and she is apparently taking her cue from an Iranian artist who in 1968 said, art can provide a vision for a way of living in an alternative future. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. It's very nice to be in Dubai. Mm. And I'd like to thank uh, Shuman, our commissar, who has put together a really brilliant um, and multifaceted discussion of the relationship between art and history. And I'd like to thank Omar for presenting my work to the commissar so that I can be here in Dubai. Um, okay. Time can be measured in pictures. An artist bears witness, recollects the past, and imagines alternative futures. Jacques Rancière explained to us that the present of art is always in the past and in the future. Um, I'm a historian, and as you all know, we, we fetishize archives. But today, I'm going to talk about an art collection as an archive. Uh, what does it mean to have artists be history scribes and have collectors be the archivists? Now, Michel Foucault said that archives are a system of discursivity. Um, they're about the formation and transformation of statements, and therefore archives let us know what can be said. So um, if we extend Michel Foucault's idea to an art collection, uh, the images embedded in the art collection give us a sense of what can be seen and how what we can see can become transformed. In her book, Le Goût de l'Archive, Arlette Bash wrote that an archive presupposes an archivist, a hand that collects and classifies. And as I said, today our archivist is the collector of Muhammad Afami. Embedded in his collection is an alternative timeline of, of an Iranian <coughs> history. That this collection is based in Dubai is not accidental, and it's actually quite fundamental to our particular historical timeline. Um, Dubai is the central capital of the Iranian art world. Dubai not only provides the market for a lot of Iranian artists and a lot of, a lot of Iranian collectors, but it also sustains the artistic imagination of this generation of Iranian artists. And as we see in the modern section, it also bears witness to our modernist past. <coughs> Dubai is also a gathering place for those of us who are central figures in the Iranian art world. Some of us can go to Iran, and some of those who work in the Iranian art world can come to Europe and the United States. Dubai welcomes us all. As long as we care about art, we can gather in Dubai. This is often where I come to meet curators and artists and collectors who are based in Tehran. So, one other thing that Arlette Tash wrote in her little book is that the history that's embedded in archives presents itself, traces of the past, sometimes in chaotic, random fashion. So let's begin our timeline of history in 2005. I started collecting in 2005. It's actually a place. And you know, as an Iranian, you go back, and you haven't been back for many years, you tend to have difficulties in your passports and paperwork, so I ended up being stuck there for about uh, two weeks. And of course, in Iran, there's not much to do except hang out with your friends, eat kebab, and then talk about the good old days. So a friend of mine called me up and said, listen, there's a great Iranian art scene flourishing. Come and have a look at some of these galleries. So I went with him, and he took me to this gallery, and I bought my first pieces. And at first I thought, well, you know, they're so aesthetically pretty, and 
very affordable. I mean, these are pieces that were 300, 400, 500 dollars, and you know, I mean, in the West, the canvas costs you more than the, than that. I, I brought the pieces back, and I sort of started getting a little bit into it. And I didn't know why that was. I mean, the family has always been into art. My great grandmother was uh, the founder of the first Iranian art institute for women in the 1930s. My grandfather from my mother's side was, a, was an avid Islamic collector. So I'd always been surrounded by art, but I'd never found my niche. And I found that being a collector in contemporary Iranian art was sort of my, my beginning of my, let's say, lifelong passion. And so I, um, I started looking at the space much more actively. It was just beginning to sort of take off. Uh, the gallery scene in Dubai had barely started. I remember there were the only curated shows in hotels. Uh, and then, you know, Third Line, XVA, all these B21, they all sort of flourished. And it became, you know, started taking a, a life of its own. Okay. So that was Mohamed Aframi speaking at the Global Art Forum in 2010 um, and his cartoon rendition. We've been calling him Cartoon Mo. Uh, cartoon Mo was created by Koji Yamamoto, who's a Brown RISD student. So the next date in our timeline is October 7th, 1928. Um, that's when the artist and poet Sohrab Sepehri was born in Kaushan. Ahle Kaushanam. Pisham Nagoshist. Goh gohi rapasi miso zambo rang. Mifrusham bishamom. Taba ovoz shagoya kilaran zendonist. Dilitan hoitan toze shavat. Chechioli. Chechioli, Midonam Pardam Bijonast, Hub Midonam, Hose Nako Shieman, Bimo Hist, Ahle Koshona. In 1953, Kermit Roosevelt, the grandson of Teddy Roosevelt, went to Tehran. He hid in the back seat of a black sedan as it drove into the driveway of the Shah's palace, and he called the Shah to come and join him in the back seat of the sedan in the driveway of the palace. This was the third visitor who had gone to the Shah to tell him that it was time to dismiss his prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh. The Shah had refused when the CIA sent his twin sister, Princess Ashraf. The Shah had refused when the CIA sent Norman Schwarzkopf. The Shah did not want to dismiss Mossadegh because he said, quote, it will lead to a civil war in Iran. Kermit Roosevelt told the Shah, I come with a direct message from Churchill and Eisenhower. And to prove to you that the message comes directly from them, Eisenhower will add a special sentence in his speech in San Francisco tomorrow. And the BBC, instead of saying it is now midnight, will say it is now exactly midnight. And those are messages from Churchill and Eisenhower telling you either you go or Mo goes. And this is part of the history in Mitra Tabrizian's surveillance. She also points to the 1979 revolution and to the Iran-Iraq war. The next date in our timeline is 1962, when the Museum of Modern Art in New York acquired two artists who work on Iranian modern art, Pilaram and Zenderudi. I believe these to be the first Iranian modern works that MoMA acquired, although MoMA is not sure. Um, I call this closeted modernism. Alfred Barr, who created the canon of modernity, knew that Iranian artists were making modern art. He bought them, he acquired them, but he never exhibited them. So we call this closeted modernism. In 1964, in his studio called Atelier Kabud, Parviz Tanaboli discovered Heech. Heech was his protest against two trends in Iranian art at the time that were disturbing to him. One was a propensity to mimic whatever the latest international art trend was. The other was his fixation on the calligraphic notation. So Zenderudi decided he was going to limit himself to one word, Heech. And as you can see, the Afghani collection has a lot of Heeches, different colors, fiberglass, and I think he might buy more before, before the whole thing's over. Um, our next date is 1966. 
This is the year that Monia Shahudi Fama Famarion took her friends, the artist Robert Morris and Marsha Hafif, and they visited the shrine of Shah Tirah in Shiraz, whose walls were adorned in Aina Kuri. Moni recalls, the very space seemed on fire, the lamps blazing in hundreds of thousands of reflections. And this was the inspiration for her mosaic mirror work, which has become one of the most iconic kind of um, works of art in contemporary modern Iranian art. May 1972, the CIA reappears in our timeline. The CIA issued a secret intelligence report titled, The Centers of Power in Iran. The report read, and I'm quoting directly from it, another factor probably played a role in Mohammad Reza's personal and political development, circumstances of the birth of his heir. A first marriage to Fozia, King Farouk's sister, was primarily a political move. The only issue of this marriage, which ended after 11, which ended in divorce after 11 years, was a daughter, end quote. In 1976, the Iranian artist Kuro Shishagaran made a poster called Peace for Lebanon. He won an award from the UNICEF for this poster, and he took it one step further. He did what he called postal art. He reproduced this poster in postcards and mailed it um, to hundreds of people inside Tehran. Sorry, I need a shot of my vodka. Okay. <laughs> January 1st, 1978, a book titled Avesta from Perspective of Modern Art was published in Tehran with 80 illustrations by Masoud Arab Shahi, including this one. In 1993, Malake Noini returned home to visit her ailing mother. And she says, quote, by the time I arrived in Iran, the funeral had already taken place. Two years later, my father also died. All that was left for me were the traces of their lives, their objects, letters, and abandoned pictures from the past. These traces tangibly connect me to my past. Each one tells a different story of a time gone by. In 1998, Abbas Kiarostami took his camera and went for a walk along the shores of the Caspian. It's a habit that he does routinely, and he calls it covering the scene of peace. To him, as a photographer of peace, the photographic moment is just as important as it is to photojournalists. Abbas Kiarostami believes there's only one moment in which a photograph can be taken. Now, this is Negar Ahyami's work that was inspired by September 11th, 2001. It's called A Bridge to Nowhere. On one side, you see what was the World Trade Center building. Negar remembers that as a young child visiting the building, the archways at the bottom reminded her of Islamic architecture. Across from that, you see her rendition of Arabesque Persian design. And in the far distance, you see a melting um, Ozadi tower. The bridge that connects them is topped with someone who is an Iranian-American, an immigrant to the United States who has now experienced the terrors of violence in both of their cities. In 2002, the artist Leila Pazuki immigrated to Germany. She got a master's degree in art theory where she read Edward Said. In her artist notebook, she started scribbling this idea of doing text art. But she said she never quite had the courage to implement her plan. Her gallerist in Germany saw her notebook and insisted that she start making this, this text art. And she decided to make it in neon. I said, looking at another neon artist who's in the audience. Um, one day, she's sitting in her apartment, and her gallerist calls her and says, oh my god, come to the studio. You don't know what this German guy is doing. She shows up, and the German guy is doing the neon backwards. Leila Pazuki says, perfect. That's how I wanted to stay. And that's how her text neons ended up being backwards. And part of her theory is, if we read from left to right, or if we read from right to left, we also see art that way. So 
2006, the artist Afsun went to Egypt. She visited the ancient monuments in Luxor and realized there were a thousand feet. You know, no matter how dissolved the ancient structures were, the feet were just perfectly shaped. And there was a merchant selling some goods on a pile on top of his uh, cloth. Hi. And amongst this was a plastic doll shoe. And she became obsessed with having to have that plastic doll shoe, which she bought. And she keeps it on her desk in her studio in London. October 31st, 2007, the hammer went down. Now, I was sitting in New York when this happened. I didn't know who did it, but I knew someone did it. Um, Mo Aframi was on a business trip, as usual. Missed the preview of the auction in the Jumeirah Hotel. He said the work didn't look like much in a catalog. It looked kind of kitsch. kitsch. He arrived late. There were about four or 500 people in the room, so he sat in the back. When Farhad Mushiri's One World came up for auction, he said, quote, I was bamboozled. It was so beautiful. And he just started bidding. And the auctioneer kept the bidding going. Mo paid $601,000 for this work of art. And at the time, it set a record for the highest price for an Iranian work of art at auction. And that record stayed for a few months. But what was important is it, it, it crossed the barrier. It provided impetus for all of us to understand that there were people who were willing to pay for Iranian art what it was worth. Now, some people like to, you know, poo-poo Farhad Moshiri and people who buy Farhad Moshiri as being totally irrelevant to what's going on in Iran. Just so happens, Afshin, an artist who lives and works in Iran, put this on her Facebook timeline, saying how much she loves and admires this work of art. So at least there's some artists in Iran who seem to be fans of Farhad Moshiri. And in fact, Afshan Ketabshi is someone that Mo collected in 2008 at the Mo Gallery in Tehran. And she started making these Warhol-esque images of Iranians in 2004. This is a series of well-known Western and Eastern figures that she rendered in the same image. You can see that Dubai is of interest to people working and living in Iran as well. In the summer of 2008, this work by Puran Jinshi was exhibited at the Vilcek Foundation in Manhattan. The Vilcek Foundation is dedicated to supporting foreign-born scientists and artists who have made outstanding contributions to society in the United States. In August 2009, then President Ahmadinejad made Time Magazine's list of top 10 worst dressed world leaders. Because of this made in China members only jacket that he wore that sells for about $30 in the bazaar. Um, the San Francisco based artist Ala Tekhar was in the Tehran Bazaar and people kept saying Kota Ahmadi, Kota Ahmadi, that's how they sell these coats in the Tehran Bazaar. So he went back to San Francisco and he bought a Kota Ahmadi in San Francisco, brought it back with him to Tehran and the, the fabric he bought in the bazaar in Tehran and the tailoring was done in Tehran. So this is an Iranian American jacket. Um, and Mo bought this in the third line in, um, in Dubai. Um, Ada tells me it's a one of a kind work of art, alhamdulillah. Okay. <laughs> so. I, you know, he's got taste. Mo Aframi has taste. You know, I'm not going to say whether it's good taste or not, but he has taste. Okay. So in the summer of 2009, Nagis Hoshemi, the young artist, was involved in the street protest in Iran after the elections. She was living a somewhat bifurcated life, though, because that summer, four or five weddings and engagements were happening in her family. So she was going between family weddings and street protests. And this work kind of is an example. The layering of the work speaks to that experience. The next date on our timeline is 8 PM.
In 2008, the photographer Nusha Tavakulian's career took off when she made the front cover of National Geographic with her beautiful photographs of Persepolis. As a woman photojournalist working in Tehran, she wasn't sure what her career would be like after the 2009 protests. She spent six months at home. This is a view from her apartment in Tehran. She decided to turn her apartment into a photography studio. And every night at 8 p.m., she photographed one of her neighbors. It's a series called Look, and it's a story about the intimacy of strangers. What happens in these high rises that we all see in Tehran when people are living in them, particularly in the isolated environment of the sanctions? Nusha told me this work is not a political statement, it's about feelings. Makes you want to smoke a cigarette, huh? <laughs> Why? Why? No smoking. Why? <clears throat> in 2012, Rostam and his horse Rash did battle in the Brooklyn studio of the artist Nikki Nujumi in a work called Masterpiece, which Nikki has told several of us is one of his most favorite works. In 2013, the Iranian art world lost two of our most special artists to cancer, Farid el and Sadaq Tirafkan. Now, in the summer of July 2013, the Ramadan hit in Tehran was an online documentary about Reza Shah. دوم اسفند سال 1299 است. بیش از هزار نفر از سربازان قزاق در نزدیکی تهران توقف کردند. فرمانده آنها افسر بلند قامتی است که چهره آفتاب سوخته، مصمم و زخم زیر ابروی او نشان از میزان تجربهش در میدانهای نبرد دارد همزمان چهار نفر از تهران به دیدار او می آیند سید زیادین تبا تبایی، سپه بود امیر احمدی، کلونل کازم خان سیاه و سرگرد مسعود خان کیهان آخرین قرار و مدارها بسته می شود و آنها با سوگند به قرآن هم پیمان می شوند که به استقلال میهن و شاه وفادار باشند و روز بعد برای تصرف تهران و کودتا ضد دولت وقت به نخست وزیری سپهدار رشدی حرکت کنند okay, so the four men, including Reza Khan at the time, who had the 1921 coup against the Rajar dynasty included my great uncle, Majur Masul Khan Kehan, whom we heard about there. Mo bought this work of art by Shantia Zakir Ameli. The man sitting next to Reza Shah in this painting is Mo's great grandfather. We have a shared history, Mo and I, that's embedded in this art that's in his collection. It's a shared history that Shantia Zakir Ameli cares about. I left Iran in 1979 when I was 14. Mo left Iran in 1979 when he was four. This artist hadn't been born yet when we left. But all three of us have a shared history, and that shared history expresses itself primarily in the art from Iran. Khalas. <laughs> I 
I'm done, right? Thank you. Um, we, we, are running, we are running late, but um, if there are one or maybe two questions uh, for, uh, for Shiva, we could squeeze them in now. Is, would it, anyone have anything they would like to ask Shiva? No one has any questions. I'll have they, they need a cigarette, I think. Yes. Clearly. Um, if not, thank you so much, Shiva. And Can I just say one thing? Yes. I meant to say it at the beginning. Um, I'd like to very much thank a, a very critical moment in this timeline is 2008 when Venetia Porter brought me to Dubai for the first time to speak at a conference she was organizing and insisted that I meet this Iranian woman. And it was the one day I had off and I wanted to go to the beach. I really had had enough of Iranian women, thank you. But you know, when Venetia tells you to do something, you do it. You guys know her, right? And so I went to this apartment on the 27th floor, and Maddie Amassidi opened the door. And I was supposed to go for 30 minutes, and five hours later, she was pushing me out the door, like, leave already, I have things to do. Um, but she knows more about Iranian art than all of us put together. And, that, and Venetia has given me many gifts in my life, but bringing Maddie Amassidi into my life was definitely one of them. I just need to add here something very important. Uh, Shiva told uh, us earlier that if she managed to get through this whole session uh, without using a certain F word and barfing on stage, it will be considered a great success. So another round of applause to Thank Shiva you. for a great success.